By 1902, after two years of fighting, a quarter of a million British troops were finally gaining the upper hand over 20,000 Boers. The dying months of the war were the cruelest. Death and desertion had whittled down Boer numbers. But the whole empire had answered Britain's call. Australia sent over 16,000, and they were all volunteers. New Zealand sent 6,500 men, the same number of horses, which were some of the best horses in the country, and a fair number of field pieces. Canada had nearly 8,000 volunteers here. So you've got these huge numbers of colonial volunteers fighting on the British side and distinguishing themselves very much so. Sometimes I think very much to the discomfort of the British generals. Difficult people, those Australians. This was less a war of pitched battles than of isolated guerrilla skirmishes. One task was to clear the veldt of civilians, to cut off support for the Boers. Walker Thompson of the Bushmen's Corps wrote to his brother about the scorched earth policy. We burned hundreds of homes and had to turn the women and children out. It's a job I can't stand. We came over to fight men, not women and children. Colonial troops were often used at the hard margins of the war, on the toughest terrain against die-hard Boer commandos. They earned a reputation for ruthlessness. The Bushveld Carboneers was an irregular outfit of Australians, loyal South Africans, British and others, raised to mop up in the wilds of the northern Transvaal. Several Carboneers were court-martialed for shooting dead eight Boers after they had surrendered. Their defense was they had orders to take no prisoners. Two Australian officers, Lieutenants Breaker Morant and Hancock, were shot by firing squad. For a practice that some got away with, as Walker Thompson witnessed. The Munster Fusiliers thought it would be easier to mind corpses than live men, so they bayoneted about 30 of the Boers, lay down, and had a good sleep. The Boers, too, increasingly committed atrocities against blacks fighting for the British. Boer General Marnie Moritz and his men operated behind the lines in the British Cape Colony. In January 1902, they reached the settlement of Lelyfontein, the story has passed down the generations. This was a rich area. It had food, it had grain, it had sheep, it had cattle, and it had horses. My child, the bush came, and they destroyed everything. They bankrupted everyone and they planted poverty in our soil. The people of Lelyfontein were fiercely loyal to Britain. They served as scouts and spies, but Marnie Moritz wasn't having any of it. It my pa na hulle toe gegaan en vir hulle gesê, kyk, hierdie story wat julle die Engelse help. My father said to them, this business of you supporting the English, we don't want it. We won't bother you, but we don't want you coming out with all that shit here. We're giving you a proclamation which will tell you the terms under which you may live here. And he read it aloud to them. And when he got to the point where it said, I do not want to find you in this war fighting for the Queen of England, 
Barnabas Link said, You bastard, don't you speak that way about my queen? And he hit my father over the head with a knob carrier. It was with a knob kiri like this that he hit Maritz, and that blow caused all the trouble right there and then. As Maritz came down in front of the church, Barney Lengs hit him with a stick. And then vengeance came into the war. They used to say that General Maritz could use this as well as any cowboy use his gun. If you look at it, you can see that it had a range of a thousand meters. It was an unusual revolver, and that you could add this on, and then you'd shoot with it butted up against your shoulder. This is the weapon he fought with at Lillefontaine. That day, they shot and killed eight colour people. The Boers then retreated through this pass, where they were ambushed by the people of Lelifontaine, who rolled boulders down onto them, killing 30 Boers. The next day, he went back with his men in an organized commando to take his revenge, because they could have killed him. Moritz and his men wiped out Lelifontaine, strewing bodies across the church garden. Forty-six killed and a hundred wounded. The survivors shackled as slaves or scattered in terror. The women folk had to bury those who were shot. My child, it was a sad story our old people told us. Boers like Moritz were determined that nothing must threaten white supremacy in South Africa. But the people of Lelifontaine had no compunction about taking on the Boers. They, like many other non-whites in South Africa, were active players in this war. Across the country there was considerable variation in allegiance. Most Basutos sided with Britain, but some believed their best hopes lay with the Boers and weren't afraid to strike out on their own. The Basutu said the English were good people and not like the Boers. My grandfather disagreed. He said a Boer will do exactly what he says. When he says, I'll pay you, he really means it. When he says, I'll thresh you, he means that as well. He gives you a good beating. You know where you are when it was. People started hating my grandfather because he continued to like them. The Boers always needed fresh supplies. They increasingly relied on sympathetic blacks, like Etienne Mufutsanyana's grandfather. He had a house not far from here. During the night, he flew a flag at his house so the Boers wouldn't get lost. He would hide them in his house while he went to Basutu land to buy clothes for them. Then they would leave and others would come and he would do the same all over again. Ma 
The Boers did not find all blacks so helpful. Those who tried to stop the Boers commandeering their food paid a heavy price, as Dora Ramotibi remembers. The Boers were criminals. We were scared of them. We hid ourselves because of the Boers. Because if they found us in our homes, they would burn our homes down. People were burned to death in their homes. The British also torched black homes to deny support to the Boers. Will Saxon of the Manchester Regiment wrote home about these operations. As far as I could see in every direction, crawls were burning. I feel sorry for the black women. The tears roll down their cheeks and the pickanins cluster around them. I always think of a wounded stag when I see them, staring at their burning huts. The British herded over 120,000 blacks into a network of 75 concentration camps. Little known about during the war, the black camps have been all but forgotten since. They initially seemed like sanctuary after the dangers of living on the felt. Anna Mollekeng has never forgotten her first sight of the Scottish soldiers. They weren't wearing ordinary clothes. They were wearing red skirts. They had fringed belts across their chests. You'd see them sashaying along. Their berets on their heads and their clothes made them look nothing like boers. This is how they walked. But conditions in the camps were a disease was rife. All save the poorest blacks had to pay for their food. The only way to earn money was to work for the British, a form of forced labor. If you didn't have a man in your family working for the army, you were charged double for rations. <laughs> This was a hard war. Our grannies used to gather locusts for us to eat. Not the big kind you have today, but little ones. They dug up worms for us to chew. We used to eat those worms and also roots from the ground just to survive. The war was heavy going. It was so tough. All we could do was live from day to day. If the inmates wanted shelter from South Africa's extreme climate, the British weren't about to provide it. The superintendent of Brantford Camp was given strict orders. Tents allotted to you are only for white camps. On no account must these be given to natives. The blacks lived as third-class citizens, and that's how they died. It was bad in those days. We didn't all get out of the camp alive. A lot of people died. The old women couldn't take it. They were dropping like flies, dead. The Reverend W.H.R. Brown was one of very few to visit a black camp. They have lost everything. And there being no political party interested in their destiny, they go to the wall, 
as the weakest are bound to. The Boers still fighting for independence called themselves bitter enders. But the tougher the struggle became and the likelier British victory looked, the more Boers changed sides. By the final months, a quarter of all Boers in the field were joiners, fighting for the British. My father was not nearly as opposed to the English as he was to the joiners. He simply could not stand them. He felt that what they had done was just unforgivable to betray your nation and your country and your people. A unit of the 600 strong farmers guard at Bloemfontein. They sided with the British to protect their farms against their fellow Boers. Hence their motto, what we have we hold, inscribed in bullets over the British crown. Joiners helped the British track down Boers and burn their farms. There were reports of Boers castrating joiners they managed to capture. There were joiners in the camps, put there for their own protection, often in positions of petty authority. The joiners, the joiners treated the people in the camps much worse than the English did. They thought they were the bee's knees. They mocked them. Your husbands are fighting, you're dying of hunger, and we've got piles of food. Many of the camps were run by renegade Boers. And you get the small, miserable interaction between people who are too close together and have no love. And I think this is what happens, and this is why in South Africa, in that war, one had the elements of a civil war. The Boers' troubles were mounting. They had relied on the British to house their families in the white concentration camps, awful as they were. By 1902, following the visit and report of the Fawcett Commission, Death rates fell and conditions improved, as Boer General Louis Butter confirmed. One is only too thankful nowadays to know that our wives are under English protection. But Lord Kitchener decided to leave the Boer women and children on the veld. Let their menfolk look after them. But the veld was now a very dangerous place. White women, black women, all were vulnerable. Maruti Setiloane recalls a story told him by an eyewitness. There came this troop of English soldiers on horseback, and there was this woman there who was gathering cow dung, dry cow dung, to go and make fire. And as they came on, there she was, obviously, naturally, like soldiers, like men who had been away from home, they were sex starved. They came and they pushed her off and they raped her. And he tells about how she lay there and one would go into her and go over and another one would come into her and go over. And every time when somebody went, and she lay with her arms open like that, they'd take a note with a queen's head and put it on her hand. That is the fairness of the British. You've got to pay for what you get. my father and others, they would uh, assault these, uh, sexually assault these uh, uh, poor girls. And you see, the point was this, it's not easy to always find a white woman around anywhere. Where I grew up on the farm, a woman was sacrosanct, a white one was sacrosanct. Here was a, an open sesame situation, where you can take these girls and they can't uh, refuse, they can't defend themselves. And very often things like that did in fact take place. European propaganda blamed the British for giving blacks power over white women. The Boers had their own response. 
My master stiff brew. My mother's stepbrother planted them in holes. When they caught a Hottentot molesting women on the farms, they would plant him like a pole in the ground, alive. They planted them so deep that they couldn't get out. Some Boers now fear that the blacks were threatening the established racial order in South Africa. A lookout point known as Grenadier Hill in the Northern Cape. The soldiers whiled away the time by carving their names. Next to the Tommies are the names of their three black comrades in arms, Ali, Sixpence and John. The Boer War had given the blacks an enhanced status alongside Englishmen and a taste of power over the Boers. My father had a uniform and a gun and uh, he had the protection of the English and uh, wherever the English were and they were, and, uh, my father was there and when the attack against the Boers, he saw the Boers run away, you know, saw the Boers run away. The Boers were frightened of the soldiers, the car keys. It was a bit of sensational pleasure to see them run away. It seemed to the Cape politician, John X. Merriman, that the genie was out of the bottle. These people will have been armed and set on to fight and harry white men. It will be difficult to get the arms from them and to teach them to unlearn the lesson. The Boers' knee-jerk reaction was to slaughter blacks they caught fighting against them. A British soldier summed it up. Johnny Boar used to shoot niggers like you'd shoot a dog. By April 1902, General Botha and General De Vett had warned the burghers still on the battlefield not to execute blacks summarily. It is clear that Botha and De Vett were worried because the consequences could be very bad for future relations. The Boers, in thinking about the post-war order, clearly saw the end approaching. They could hardly move for the maze of British blockhouses and barbed wire. They could scarcely find food in a land devastated by the British. The Boers were outgunned and outnumbered. My mother saw these overwhelming hordes of English soldiers. She often told us that when they marched towards the Boers, it looked as if the earth was trembling. And when an English soldier fell dead in battle, the others simply climbed over him and kept on coming and coming. It was really a hopeless task for the Boers to carry on fighting, for the Boers even to think of winning the war. The 11th of April, 1908, Boer Commandant Potgitter lay dead on the felt after the last formal battle of the Boer War. Hostilities seemed to fizzle out and the Boers agreed to peace talks. The Boer delegates met on the 15th of May, south of Pretoria, at Vereniging. The more they talked, the clearer the calamity became. Men spoke of a dire lack of food and horses, of the treachery of joiners, and of their family's plight on the felt. They'd always believed God would never let them be defeated. The will of God was for the burghers very important. The will of God was very important to the burghers. And when the talks were held at Vereniging, some people said, what if God is not on our side? Or what if God wants us to lay down our weapons and submit to the inevitable, to the fact that we have lost our independence? 
What if God is not with us? Peace negotiations with the British took place in this pavilion. The Boers were offered guarantees of personal freedom and property rights. The right to use their language in school and courtroom. A three million pound compensation fund for farmers. And the promise of future political autonomy. But would there be any extension of rights to the blacks, as suggested a year before by Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain? We cannot consent to purchase a shameful peace by leaving the colored population in the position in which they stood before the war. But now the priority was to reconcile British and Boer interests. Earlier advice of Lord Milner pointed the way forward. You only have to sacrifice the nigger absolutely, and the game is easy. Britain ensured white dominance and black subjugation by leaving it to the Boers to decide whether to give voting rights to the blacks, thus condemning them to nearly a century of exclusion and oppression. When the peace treaty was being negotiated at Franklin, my people were not there. The black people were not there. Not only were the blacks not there, but even the interests of black, blacks were not taken in. And we were easy to be got rid of. Some black peoples, like the Bahatla in the western Transvaal, had seen the war as a chance to regain land the Boers took from them long before, to settle old scores. The Bahatla had fought valiantly on the British side, they believed that, come victory, their loyalty would be rewarded. We hoped the talks would lead to us getting our land back. But we were not allowed to take part in the discussions. They didn't keep us in the picture. We were just ignored. We had fought in the war to recover our land. If we didn't get back, what was the point of us fighting? But then the whites buried the hatchet and closed ranks against us. They became like brothers, dividing our land between themselves. And we were left with nothing. In 1902, the Boers signed the surrender terms ensuring their eventual supremacy in South Africa. But at the time, they felt their world had caved in. My father was in torment. They say that that morning he got onto his horse and rode around like a man possessed. The thought of peace terrified him, and he did not know how to deal with it. And when General Smut returned to his men and said it was peace, there was great animosity. Because the people did not want peace. They said the only thing that should come between a man and his freedom is death. Marnie Moritz's men were actually photographed surrendering. But Moritz was far away. He and others had chosen exile rather than life under British rule. The Boers now had to go through the humiliating formalities, signing the oath of allegiance to the Crown, giving up their weapons. My pa was very uh, unhappy, want hulle moes hulle my father was very unhappy at having to hand over his guns at Vereniging. It was very difficult for him to bid farewell to his gun because it had been his friend for three long years. Three difficult, bitterly difficult years. There was one gun Daddy did not give up, his Mauser rifle. That one he kept. He just handed in his Lee Metford. My father was heartbroken that the Boers had lost. They lost their country, they lost everything. Many lost their wives and children. So they were bitter and very unhappy. But under the circumstances they could not carry on anymore. De Vett and other Boer leaders went around the white camps 
explaining the peace deal to the inmates. Some women had wanted the war to continue, saying, I can get a new husband, but I can't get a new Transvaal. But others asked, What is the independence of my country to me when my man is dead? And then, the leaving of the camps, as Christina Ninaba remembers. <laughs> The day came when they told us, the war is over. Get your things together, we'll drop you in Johannesburg. Everyone got on the wagons. Some women were weeping, some laughing and some singing. Singing for the dead children they were leaving behind. The British had incarcerated Boer prisoners of war on the island of St. Helena and in Ceylon and Bermuda. Now these men came home and went in search of their families. Some men arrived at the camps only to find no one in their family alive. No child, no wife, nobody. The man would stand there with his hat on his head and his horse at his arm, and he'd ask, where are they? And the reply would come, they're over there in the cemetery. Recognizing your own father could be a problem. My father came home. I was small and silly. My father sat there. My mother said, say hello to your father. I said, that's not my father. My father doesn't have hair around his face. That's a baboon. The group of women on the station embraced their husbands and cried, and it was a terrible scene. But my grandmother was a tiger of a woman, and she said to my grandfather, Gideon, don't just stand there blubbing. There's work to be done on the farm. There was nothing. Nothing on the farms. The corn was burnt. The grain fields were burnt. Wheat had been emptied from sacks and trampled by horses. The joiners profited little from collaboration. Many returned to ruined farms and the undying hatred of their Boer neighbors. Everything they owned was destroyed. If you set fire to my fields, the wind will blow the flames across to theirs. They thought they'd get cakes and ale, but they only got thorns. The British Tommy had secured South Africa and her mineral wealth for the empire. Now he too was going home. A demob parade in Preston. A scene repeated across Britain. Mary Liverseed remembers that day. When the soldiers came home, we went to see them return. They were in this dull khaki, and they marched round the town hall, and then they stood, and the bonfire was lit, and they watched the bonfire, 
and looking back, I can picture them now, and I think they looked embarrassed more than happy to be home. They're quite embarrassed standing with this bonfire as their reward for coming back. <laughs> The war had different endings for each of the participants. Britain and her colonies left over 22,000 behind in South Africa, buried in cemeteries and on the felt. Over 100,000 dead and wounded. As Rudyard Kipling wrote, we have had no end of a lesson. It will do us no end of good. The Boer War established a pattern of empire solidarity, which would include South Africa, repeated in conflicts down the century. It gave more than a taste of wars to come, against freedom-fighting guerrillas and against civilians, colonial strife and total war. Battles like Spion Cop were curtain raisers for the slaughter on the Somme. In time, the Boer War receded from Britain's memory, eclipsed by two world wars. It had ushered in the modern age, but no longer seemed part of it. The Imperial Light Horse Memorial bears a fitting epitaph. Tell England, past this monument, we who died serving her, rest here content. But the blacks were not content. Most had to give their guns back to the British and land back to the Boers. They faced poverty and famine. By the end of the war, there were more blacks fighting than Boers, but they got almost no compensation and even less recognition. They had defended Mafeking with their lives, but Baden-Powell fibbed to the Royal Commission on the war, saying they had run away at the first shots. A memorial was put up to Mafeking's gallant white defenders. The blacks were a grudging afterthought. The tens of thousands of blacks who supported the Boers and fought alongside them fared even worse. What gets one really worked up? today is when the Africana wants to make as if he is the only one who lost in the Boer War and forgets that the black man shared as much of his riches, of his livelihood, and even of his blood, I say, I two uncles in the Boer War. There is this bitterness against the Boer for not having remembered them. And that is the reason why, when the, 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 the whole question of the celebration of the Boer War in South Africa came, we said, rubbish, how can you come and celebrate in an African country, in a country that has become free, the ignominy that has been suffered by the black men at the hands of the Africana, who at the Boer War used us Bei dir des Hans verloren. But the Boers had their own agenda to set themselves apart from and above all other peoples in South Africa. The white concentration camps would play a key role in that process. Orange River Station Camp is one of the very few untouched since the inmates left a century ago. <laughs> 
26,000 poor women and children, 10% of their population, perished in the camps from disease and neglect. The experience scarred the survivors and their families for life. There was so much sadness in those songs. It has stayed with me my whole life. I cannot forget it. At the second verse, my grandma would start singing with her tiny, squeaky little voice. It was like a bat floating above my grandpa's baritone. And at the third line, the dog would start howling along with them. That became a tradition in our home. I asked my father, why are grandpa and grandma so sad? My father told me it was because of the concentration camps. Grandpa and grandma never ever got over it. The twin girls who died and the other little children, grandpa never recovered. But private grief and bitter personal memories like these were exploited to underpin white supremacy. The first moves had come in 1913, when the Boers, by now self-governing, met at Bloemfontein to honor those who died in the white concentration camps. The suffering and deaths of the women and children in the concentration camps was an important cornerstone in the establishment of Afrikaner nationalism in the 20th century. The white concentration camps were elevated to the only concentration camps in existence to represent the suffering and to unite the Afrikaner people. The argument went, we are a people purified by adversity. We alone have suffered like this. We alone are fit to rule in South Africa. History that didn't fit was obliterated. Even the black maids who accompanied their Boer mistresses into the white camps were quickly forgotten. The camps were built over with somber memorials to the white dead. The black servants who died there were buried some distance away in unmarked graves. As for the black concentration camps, over the years their very existence was expunged from South Africa's history. The white concentration camps became everything, and yet the suffering in the black concentration camps was as bad. A very neglected aspect of the war is that we did not utilize the common ground that we had with the blacks in this country. I'm speaking now from an Afrikaner's point of view. That we did not make more of the black concentration camps. Not to make political games, but rather to emphasize the common suffering, which is the most important potential unifying factor between us and the blacks. A century of silence and cover-up has made the black camps very hard to find today. An old map shows one in the Free State, near Alamans Siding. There is no record of the camp's exact location, but there are graves on a nearby hillside. Not one or two, but many. Hermanus Pitsu the black farm worker who found the graves shows them to local historian Johan Lok. They are watched by the owner of the land 
Andre Hayes. Her family wasn't here during the Boer War, and she had no idea there were graves on her farm. Some of these graves contain more than one body. Current estimates put black deaths in the camps at 18,000. But new discoveries are pushing the figures upwards. It's possible that as many people died in the black concentration camps as in the white. Ik ken ook Hermanus, nou hier rondgelopen bij die begraafplaats, om te kijken wat ons krijgt. En als het ook die grafte geteld is. Ja, hoeveel is dat? 638 grafte. Ja, die kunnen die gloeien, die gewoonte. Bij die grafte. Ons denkt, dit is die grafte van een Britse concentratiekamp voor zwart mensen. Maar ik pas zelf, het is geweerd dat die kamp was. Hoe die geweerd is grafte die van die... begraafplaatse bij nabijkamp geweest. Maar dit is een taak voor de toekomst, want we gaan hem krijgen. Ja, ik wonder. Die korrige lukken. Ja, dat is zo'n toe, waar die land is. Dan moet we gaan hem krijgen, maar anders moet je zeggen, zoek voor die kamp en ook zijn mannen zoek voor die kamp. En zoek voor Aswoop en zoek voor Aswoop. Nou, die skrikker moet gezegd. Ja, dat kan je wat zoek plaats voor dat. Ja, dat blijkt krijgen. The Boer War has cast a long shadow across the century. Only since black majority rule can its lost history, shared by blacks and whites, be recovered. <laughs> 